Welcome to A Journey of Hope and Healing. We'd like to thank Kevin Song and Detroit Public Television for the opportunity to be with you, each of you today. We're streaming this portion of the conference on the Detroit Public TV webpage, as well as the Kevin Song Facebook page. A recording will be made available for viewing through WTVS Detroit Public Television and on the kevinsong.org following the conference. If you find it helpful, you can share with others or view at another time. As we're virtual this year, we're mindful what's being presented may bring up a range of emotions. We want you to know there are free 24-hour services available to contact. You may call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text HELLO to 741-741 to reach the crisis text line. Starting in approximately 35 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to send myself and our panelists questions or comments, dropping them in the comments section of the Facebook or email DPTV producer Emily at the email address on your screen. We will address as many questions as possible in the time that we have towards the end of the panel discussion. Each of you are joining for us for personal reasons. For some, you're here to learn about how to be a support for those who have been impacted by suicide. For others, you're just new to suicide grief, a club that you never wanted to be part of, nor did you ask for. Maybe so recent, you're just trying to breathe and wrap your heart around this life-changing experience. And yet others who've lost loved ones 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe hoping to hear some new information or reconnect. Over the next 90 minutes, I'm gonna share a little bit about myself you're gonna hear from our survivor panelists, and then we'll take Q and A's from you and our viewers, and a time to reflect in the Memorial Garden. Although we're virtual, we encourage you to hear our stories and to be present with us in heart. Now for myself, my name is Barb, and first and most importantly, a survivor of my 20-year-old brother John's suicide. Because of his death, I founded the Barb Smith Suicide Resource and Response Network, I made a decision within months after my brother's suicide that although his death changed our family, it was not going to destroy me. The pain, the anguish, and the lack of understanding. I grieved first, then I traveled around the country to whatever limited resources were out there. Nobody was talking about suicide then. I needed to understand it because it didn't make sense to me. How could we lose someone so incredible? It was unbearable. Suicide didn't happen to good people. It was there on my travels that I found hope. So now I facilitate our local support group. I'm a leader for our local outreach team. I'm a survivor of suicide loss advocate and a trainer for suicide prevention. It was a long journey and one that I couldn't continue, that I will continue to travel the rest of my life. Years ago, no one talked about suicide. It was shameful, guilt, blaming, anger, confusing, and most of all, silent. But I'm here to tell you, we're changing the way we talk and understand suicide. We no longer need to be alone nor silent. We now have the Governor Suicide Prevention Commission working to help prevent suicide and care for those who've been impacted. Groups like Kevin Song coming together with one voice. There's now a post-suicide prevention model that helps those who care for those impacted by suicide and to understand how we can better care for those survivors of suicide loss. It was developed by the TAPS Trauma Assistance Program for Survivors. It was written for veterans families, but it can be used by anyone who supports and cares for the suicide bereaved. I think of it sort of as a roadmap, right? I want you to listen as our panelists share their grief journey. You may recognize it in their stories, but no, this is only a guide. Suicide is individual and it can be quite complicated. In this model, you'll see that there's three phases. You know, if, if suicide was so seamless, but it's not. But in this grief model, you're going to see there's stabilization, grief, and growth. Stabilization is really about assessing for trauma and taking care of the immediate needs of the survivors of suicide loss to help minimize further complications coordinating care for the first hours and the weeks following the death. If we look at the grief work, grief work is really about talking about the suicide and the death and the pain, 
It's about supporting the person and working through their grief and all the emotions that go with it, and then really working towards remembering how they lived. Somehow this could be done with support groups, peer, peer groups, or those who've had the same experience. Growth, if we look at growth, this is about moving towards post-traumatic growth in a fully intentional way. Positive psychological change that happens because of adversity or challenge. I call this finding purpose for your pain. It's like getting involved in suicide prevention, aftercare, speaking out, or just continue living in a healthy way for yourself. Although this model is linear, you can see that the circles are overlapped. Suicide grief is as individual as the people who died and the circumstances surrounding their death. I heard a speaker once quote, Jenny Landon said, we can't be our best selves by ourselves. Together, we will survive. At this time, let me introduce our panel of hope and see if you can follow their personal journey, possibly relate to a place you've traveled or experienced yourself. So let us begin. So Matissa, would you mind introducing yourself and what brought you here today? Hello, my name is Matissa. I'm here as a mother of two wonderful children. I have a 28 year old son named Dalvin here on earth and a 19, 19 year old daughter named Brittany. Brene died by suicide in November of 2018. Brene was kind, friendly, full of joy, and very loving. She also was very athletic. She enjoyed playing volleyball, basketball, and doing track and field, doing the shot put. She was state ranked for the state of Michigan. She was the life of our family with a sense of humor, charm, and willingness to help anyone. She enjoyed spending time with her family and friends. Look at her, her smile was infectious. It could light up a room full of people and she did not even have to say a word. I share about Brittany because I don't want, to, want her suicide to define her. Br Brittany ended her life two and a half years ago following her fight with mental illness and depression. She had 16 wonderful years and three not so wonderful years. Thank you, thank you for joining us through Facebook Live today for help hope and healing, just like I have received over the last two years. Thank you, Matissa. Thank you, Matissa, for sharing Brittany with us. And Tessa, would you like to introduce yourself and what brought you here today? Yes, I am Tessa. I am a survivor of suicide loss. My husband of 38 years, Jeff, lost his battle to suicide January 14th, 2014. I am here today hoping to help others who have struggled and suffered as I have. That's my late husband, Jeff, with my granddaughter, Emma. Thank you, Tessa. And then we have Mark. Mark is joining us from Louisiana. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here with you today. My name is Mark Wilson. I do live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My story is a little bit different. It was March the 11th, 1972, my 41-year-old dad, Harry Wilson, ended his life. I was uh, 17 uh, and one of five surviving members of our family. Uh, in the, I like to think that we exchanged one nightmare for another in that we lived through his escalating uh, illness, alcoholism and lived that nightmare and then it shifted to another nightmare when he ended his life as was the uh, wisdom of the time it was it was not spoken of the, his name was not mentioned the s word was not mentioned uh the, the attempt was made to let's don't upset the family let's don't upset mark let's don't talk about it so as a result it was over 20 years before i spoke of my dad uh, of our relationship together. I couldn't have pictures of him. He was simply erased from our family. Uh, during those 20 years, I suffered more than I can even uh, express uh, silently alone, as Barb was mentioning. My purpose in, in sharing my particular experience and story is that I would love more than anything to alleviate the, uh, the suffering that others might be experiencing to, to encourage people to find safe people, to share about what happened, and how it feels, you know, and the hope that they might find the life and healing and wholeness and peace sooner rather than later. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Mark. And next we have Frank. Frank, would you mind introducing yourself and what brought you here today? Um, yep, of course. So, um, hi everybody. My name is Frank Blackman, Jr. Um, I'm a 17-year-old student from um, Detroit, Michigan. I attend the University of Detroit Jesuit High School in Detroit, Michigan. Um, my story stems a little bit differently um, from everybody as well. Um, my story actually happened at school where um, U of D was faced with um, three awful deaths um, as a result of suicide um, from students and one of them being my close friend. Um, so with that, um, what I did was I since then developed a passion for mental health. Um, public speaking, um, we initiated a club at our school called Be Nice, which is a suicide um, slash mental health awareness program. Um, and so, yeah, the reason I'm here today is just to speak from a youth perspective, um, help anybody who doesn't understand what their kid is going through, and kind of be that voice for um, kids who are struggling. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you so much, Frank, for being a voice for our youth. So, and I really appreciate the courage that it took for each one of you to join us on this panel today. So our next question might be, what was something that someone said or did for you early on that was helpful? And we're gonna start with Matisse again. Hi, well, although many things were helpful um, during the first, the first part of the grieving process, certain things do stick out on my mind. Um, particularly the night that um, Brittany's death happened, her um, Barb, Barb was brought to us at the police station and helped with uh, who to call, what to say, um, things like that, that was really helpful. When I returned back to work for the first day, my father was at my house when I came home because for the last past two years, he, my daughter will always be at home, Brene would always be at home opening the door for me. So he didn't have much to say, actually he probably didn't know what to say at that time. He just showed up, was there for me at 545 when I returned home from work. My first Mother's Day, two of Brene's friends brought over a card and roses for me uh, because they thought it would be a very difficult day being it was my first Mother's Day without her. I cherish her friends a lot, um, more than just the two that I mentioned, but receiving flowers from them and them believing that I really deserved those flowers and it was my first time was really thoughtful and kind of them. I also attend support group. Um, my first support group, um, there was a mother there that was slightly farther along in her journey. Um, I kind of attached to her because she was, you know, getting through grief. And I really enjoyed and thought there was hope for me. Um, and she let me know that things would be okay in the, in the future um, and to look forward into positive things. And I've met many wonderful people at group um, and I have a great support system. Thank you, and I think it really shows, Matisse, the value of that early onset and the stabilization and how important it is to be with someone in the immediate minutes to really just help you breathe. And beyond that, it's like, where do you go next? Where it, it takes more than just one person, but you had family and friends and support group, and it just shows that a whole network to help people survive in these early hours. So Tessa, what might you have to share with us? The first person that I recall extending themselves was a very dear friend of our family, Sue. And at Jeff's funeral, took me aside and said, when you're ready, I want to help you be a widow. She had been a widow for many years under completely different circumstances. And at that moment, I could not think of myself as a widow. So it took me several weeks, perhaps months, to reach out to her and the first luncheon we had, she handed me a piece of paper with a list of names and phone numbers. And she said, you are going to need a handyman and you are going to need a plumber and you are going to need an electrician. And she gave me a list of her people and said, I'm giving these to you. I've already contacted them. They will help you. We continue to have lunches almost every month when we could before the pandemic. She shared with me how my relationships would change with couples. She has been a mentor to something I never thought I would need. I was helped by many people, but that first moment 
meant the world to me. You said it best when you said, I'm going to show you how to be a widow. Like it's a word that you can't even comprehend. Like that's not who I am. I am a wife. So what a great gift she had in showing up and to be that support. Mark, what was helpful for you? Well, the, the, the truth is, is I can't think of a thing that was really helpful to me or my family in those early years following my dad's death. It's not that there weren't good intentions from people. They just didn't know what to say. They just didn't know what to do. Everybody pretty much quickly took the cue to just be silent on the subject. It was a conspiracy. Let's don't mention. Let's, uh, let's let him get on with his life. Let's put all this behind him. Uh, so the result was, uh, in, in my case, one thing that did help me is I learned how to take massive quantities of drugs and alcohol. That would relieve for me uh, the anguish, the pain, the fear that just uh, ran through me and ravaged me. And so I learned to do that. Uh, I don't think I took a, a sober breath for 10 years. The, uh, the drugs and alcohol, as a matter of fact, may have been the thing that actually kept me alive during, my, uh, during my, the first 10 years following my dad's death. Didn't, didn't speak of him. The thing that I had swore to myself is that above all else, I would not be like my dad. And I watched myself become exactly like my dad in terms of the drinking, the depression, the, uh, the, the aching for a living, the aching from my own end. And so uh, that's, that's the way it was uh, in the first years following his death. Thank you for sharing that and what a different experience that you had compared to what Matisse had and that's what we we understand is suicide is so different especially in the responses and the care that you might receive so Frank why don't we talk about yourself um, yeah so for me you know um, obviously my school went through a really rough time um, nobody really knew what direction to go into because so many kids were kind of at a low point but I will say this is that they did a great job with um, initiating small friend groups and I know um, the close friend group of my friend that um, passed away um, they all set us in one room and we had conversations and there was a lot of tears that came out of it but it was also a lot of laughter um, and overall it brought us a lot closer to each other so I really commend them for for stepping up and doing something about what was going on in our school and it really helped um, everybody find closure in it and you know we're not 100 percent obviously um, but but we still um, got some closure and got um, some laughter and got a lot closer out of it. Um, so yeah, I commend them for that and that was something that really helped me um, during that time. Well, thank you. And you know, we look at it as like sometimes people don't really know what to do or how to help. So let's give an example, sort of in the opposite is, give us an example of what someone's good intention, right, had a negative result. So a good intention that had a negative result. Matisa? Honestly, when I thought of this question, Barb, I really can't think of anything. I felt so much love and support for um, during the time of Brittany's passing. Um, anything that could have been negatively, negatively impacted was overruled with all the love and concern for me during that situation. Um, so that I didn't have any um, bad intentions or ill will that I felt. If it, if, if it was said, I did, not, I did not hear about it and still have until this day. Well, thank you, and I appreciate being honest. I remember when I asked that, you said, I feel kind of bad, like, not having that, but I think it just shows the scope of people's response. So, Tessa? One of the things that I want to talk about is how important it is to receive the right kind of help. I was unfortunate in that I was referred to a psychiatrist who had had very little experience uh, with someone in my situation. Um, she was not experienced in grief trauma. She was not experienced in suicide loss. And I was to the point of being debilitated. I couldn't drive. I was still in shock. I was suffering from PTSD. And she began uh, prescribing medications for me, um, anti-anxiety, sleep medications, anti-depression. And over the period of about a year and a half, um, she kept adding to my prescriptions. And it not only kept me from probably recovering sooner, but it did not help. And my son who was staying with me, I reached out to my therapist who had referred me to her and felt that they neither one really 
had the experience. It's so important to realize that grief trauma from suicide is special and you need to find help with someone who will be able to guide you and help you understand the under thing that is un not understandable. I'm grateful that I finally found the right therapist. Thank you. And I think it just becomes complicated. So thank you, Tessa, and I'm sorry that it, you know, it was painful for you. So Mark, what was, what were, um, for you was not helpful? Well, like I said, there was a lot of people around that had good intentions and they wanted to help me and they wanted to help our family. They just didn't quite know how in those days. So one of the things that, that uh, I was told repeatedly that uh, that I was now at 17, the man of the family needed to take care of my mother. My family was shattered. There's no, there's no other way to say it than that. But I needed to take care of my mother, my, my much younger brother, my two sisters, and that I was to be, you know, their caretaker and make everything all better. When really all I wanted to do was bring myself into a good being, and I was the, the, in the aftermath of my dad's affairs and business arrangements and all that, we tried to manage all that. And, uh, I was in way, way, way over my head. As I watched my family spiraling downward, and concluded that, that I had actually failed, that uh, there was going to be no, uh, no pardon for this. This was an unpardonable sin. I had failed, and that, uh, and that that's, that, that was a cross I was going to have to carry. So, you know, that's quite interesting. Like we work with a lot of families um, at the scene or at a home and oftentimes right when we arrive, if a parent or father or mother taken their life, oftentimes they look at the adult child and even at 17, you weren't quite the adult and they sort of put that responsibility on and I think it has that good intention, you know, Mark, to say something like, you know, you need to take care of your mother, you need to take care of the family or you're the man of the house. And what happens is it does self-destruct a lot of our young people. That's way too much pressure to put on them. So if anyone has the opportunity to work with families early on, to remind them that the kids still need to grieve and they should not be responsible for the whole family. And I think if anything's learned from your message today, Mark, it can have a very negative result for long terms. So asking a young person to be the caregiver or the adult in the family is not really helpful. So, Mark, how about anything that didn't feel helpful at time at the time for you? Um, yeah, so for me, you know, um, I will say that a lot of people did help me, and it was a really um, rather giving time um, coming from the perspective of somebody else looking at me as a young person who was struggling with something um, mental health related and losing a, a close friend. But I will say that one of the questions that I got a lot was, you know, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Um, and I know that's, that seems pretty protocol to ask of a kid who just lost someone close to them, but um, when somebody's grieving and really hurting and it's a lot of pain, I think the best way to solve that is through open conversation and not through um, those hard-hitting questions to start off. Um, so yeah, that was something that really, that really not affected me, but I, really, I will say that that was something that had a, um, people thought it was positive, but it could have had a negative effect on a lot of kids. So um, yeah, that question for sure. I, I actually, could I ask you a question, Frank, and, and maybe this is individual, but I think that question might be, when the adults asked you if you've had thoughts of suicide, what could have been a, another question or something else that might, might would have been more helpful? What could have been more helpful than making sure that you were, and I think it's really about they wanted to make sure you were safe, but what else could have been more helpful even? Yeah, so I think something that's more helpful is just um, having those conversations without um, asking those hard-hitting questions to start off with. I know that um, a lot of times when I talk to people about who have similar experiences than me or ser similar experiences as me, I know we have, a, we have deep conversations and we kind of talk through it rather than um, immediately asking somebody if they're thinking about killing themselves. So I think just with um, if parents just kind of learn more about their child, um, start educating themselves more about mental health in general, I think, I think um, we will be good, and I think that's a good start to understanding. So, what was the most painful part of your journey thus far, or 
you know, or the greatest challenge, and how did you work through it? Matisa? Well, when I asked this question, um, I took a look, a deep look, and I really miss my friend, Brittany. I miss her physical presence. Um, it was the first time I thought about her and her death this way. Me and Brittany spent so much time together, living alone um, as a single parent with one child at home for five years. We did everything together. I attended all her sports events. I, um, we went shopping together. We did, tra we traveled to Disney World. I took her um, trick or treating on Halloween. We just did quite a few things together that I, I miss. I miss her physical presence. Um, we had great conversations. She would give advice that you wouldn't think, you would not think an 18 or a 19 year old would even have knowledge of. Um, so I, I miss that about her. Um, I am working on believing her spirit is with me everywhere I go and taking it and doing some of the things that we used to do together and enjoying them as if she was still here, just spiritually with me. And I continue to talk about her story um, because I believe we need more awareness. Thank you, and I'm, I'm so proud, Matista, and I remember asking you that question and you were really taken a surprise when you answered that it was your friend. It was really the first time that you did acknowledge it and it truly, I could just see it in your face. And sometimes as the grief journey goes, we start to lose and remember certain parts of the relationship and it's not always at the first start of it. So thank you. Tessa? Jeff and I were married for 38 years and the most painful part was realizing that the world did not stop. Um, I looked around me and people were going about their lives and I had absolutely no idea um, how to be alone. Um, the simple things like going to a grocery store took many tries before I was finally able to make it all the way through the store and out. Paying bills, um, going to appointments, I would find myself driving in circles. I. Um, I struggled with waking up in the morning and not having him there. We had been retired for a few years and had been together so much. And when you have that person in your life and they're suddenly gone, um, it is more of an adjustment than you can ever imagine. I was so fortunate to have my children, but to see the pain that his death impacted on them made it even harder for me. I was fortunate to find my support group, SOS, um, but I was always the only widow. And my situation wasn't any worse than anyone else's, but it was unique. And I wish that I had had someone that had been through a similar experience. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm really sorry. It just seems to be a painful time when you plan for retirement, you plan for a future, and within minutes, everything changes, and to really start all over again, to really finding yourself. I think, you know, it's a long journey, and it's a hard journey. So, Mark? Alone and silent is, was for me, for decades, torture. And I have found that the thing that has helped me with these painful things that I've lived with over the years is, is uh, sharing. I've, I've often thought that sorrow shared is sorrow diminished. It can, it's made bearable. Things that the kind of, kind of things that I ruminated about for years and years and years was my dad's final days, uh, hours alone in the motel room that he, that he sought out to end his life, going through his papers, writing his note, contemplating his life and his death and his family and, and the, the, the desolation and the pain and the sadness and the horror of those last hours. You know, I could replay that in my mind a million times over the years, and, but I never was able to share it until I found my way into a group. Uh, and it just absolutely tortured me. Uh, the, uh, it, uh, to this day, it takes my breath away thought of his suffering and me and everyone being unable to do anything about it. So but sharing that has helped diminish it. It loses its power. And I've, been, I've become at ease with that. Another thing that, that I've, uh, 
I've suffered with over the years is that is, remember I've lived now without my dad almost 50 years. Uh, I've met a thousand people in these years and uh, as, as the subject of dads would come up and eventually the, the, my dad dying at 41, well, how did he die? Well, that's awful young. I would have to uh, relay the fact that he ended his life. And the, it was that news always sucks the air out the room. It, the, the look of horror comes on people's face. Uh, and, you know, and it's always been terribly painful because I see how his whole life is diminished by the way it ended. And, that, and it's, it's hard then to go back and say what a beautiful human being he is and was. Uh, but the, having to having to live with the, the stigma and the horror that everyone feels around suicide. Now, again, I've gotten more experience with this over the years as I've become more ease with with uh, how he died. Other people are more ease with it. Plus, it's just easier now in 2021 than it was in 1972. So, so. Thank you. And I, I think that shows and really notes the value of being with people. And we talk about that model of stabilization. Um, oftentimes for survivors, even though they didn't experience or weren't in the, um, in the moment of the death or they didn't um, see it, you start to have this movie in your head. It's like it just keeps playing over and over, just like you noted, Mark. And until you find that person who's comfortable to hear your story and to help you process it, it becomes very, uh, very much traumatizing and can affect your whole life. And I'd like to be able to say, because Dr. Frank Campbell is my friend and mentor, and Mark, you were so blessed and so lucky to have him come into your life, no matter whether it was early on or later. But I think it speaks to the value of the loss team and how important each one of us can be a support as soon as possible to help minimize the trauma for the families who've been impacted, because it does affect your whole life. And I really appreciated that how your death died, your father died, you know, it doesn't define who they were in life. And when we were practicing earlier and you showed me early on, you didn't talk about your dad much and you never had pictures. And then all of a sudden you showed us a picture um, when we were practicing and you told me you had like five pictures around your house, all of your dad. And it became more not being shameful, but really proudful on how prideful of how your father raised you and who you were. So thank you for that. Frank? Yeah, so for me, um, you know, the same could be said for a lot of my friends as well. It's just the feeling of self-doubt. Um, just because you, you try to identify, um, you see this person every day at school, you, you kind of know his behaviors, his, his attitude. Um, and for my friend in particular, he's a really upbeat person. Um, so just not knowing um, that is something internally going on with him was the, probably the biggest struggle that we had to deal with. Um, and then, you know, you kind of walk, walk around school and kind of just go through the motions instead of really living life with purpose. And I think that that was a big struggle for, for me and a lot can be said, and that can be said for a lot of uh, my friends as well. So yeah, and then for my school losing two other kids, um, it, was just a, it was just a challenge for everybody. So I think just having that negative energy around you um, was a big challenge, for, big struggle for me as well, um, just because nobody was in an upbeat mood and it was kind of it was kind of um, a bad phase overall. So yeah, for me that was the toughest challenge. Okay. Well, thank you. So let's move on to finding purpose for your pain. You know, we use a quote in our support group that says, "You know, suicide changes you, but it doesn't have to destroy you." So Matisa, what have you found that has worked for you, and how have you found purpose for your pain? Okay, so the purpose for my pain, I have. The first time I spoke publicly about Brittany was at my church in June of 2019. I spoke about the differences of mental health and mental illness um, and what exactly Brittany was diagnosed with and what I was doing as a parent to help and understand her better. In June um, of 2019, 2019 we also celebrated uh, her 20th birthday. Um, I posted a picture, pictures of her every day for the month of June. Um, I also planned a butterfly release and balloon release for her birthday on June 23rd of 2019. I've also participated in a local, uh, local at my local city panel discussion for suicide loss with Barb Smith. 
We have an annual mental health seminar in November, sponsored by my mother, Brittany's grandmother, um, every year. Um, I organize a team, Brittany, for the Walk for, for Barbara Smith's Walk for Hope. We walk in it every year. Um, it helps raise awareness and money to help others with their struggle. I also attended soft, Safe Talk training, which is where I learned suicide awareness and how to help others. And I can say that course was really helpful because I've had to help others since I've taken it and before I've taken it. So that was really helpful for me. And again, I'm just so proud of Matisa and, and the fact that you've taken your purpose or your pain and you have found purpose. And what I really appreciate it is you speaking out and it really was early on in your grief. And we trying to talk about that model where, you know, stabilization and then grief work and then um, growth. And what had happened, and I hope, you know, we talked about this before is early on you started speaking out right away and then you had to take a break and you had to go back to doing more of your grief work. So it kind of goes back to, you know, going back in this grief journey, you know, it's just, it's confusing and different times in your life come up. But I also appreciated the fact that you started taking trainings because one of the things we've learned is um, another quote is, you know, we can't change what, have ha what has happened, but we can change how we live because it happened. And having a better understanding so that you can help others. And that is how we honor those that we've lost by making a difference in the lives of other people. So with that, Tessa. I struggled with the stabilization part for a long time. Um, I tried to fulfill some of the charity work that Jeff had done, raising money for Reese for graves of veterans. I stayed involved with his friends, um, but I was so sad and found it hard to have a desire to continue living. And um, after probably a couple of years, I had an epiphany that if I died, people would remember me only as the sad, overwhelmingly devastated person, and I did not want my life to end that way. And so I made some drastic changes. I had to find my own passions. I had to find a reason for me to search for joy and accept joy, and I sold our house. I had to distance myself from people. I started traveling. I changed my name. I moved. I opened myself up to the possibilities of having a life without him, without losing the memory of that life and without losing him. I still struggle with that. It's hard to integrate my past life with my present life, but I know that for my future, I have to be able to do that. And I turned to therapy, to my children, my friends, to my partner, Roberto, who has been my biggest supporter. So Tessa, it's really it has been a journey. And we talk about a journey not only through grief, but I like when you shared that picture of you traveling. And it's sometimes when we lose ourselves, we find a new self and you've become very adventurous and you've traveled to parts of the world you never would have done just in not only searching for yourself, but really finding your new self. So thank you for that. Mark, what have you found to be your purpose for your pain? So my experience is this, is that alcoholism, drug addiction is a menacing killer and it runs wide and deep in my family. When I had a chance at 27 to get clean and sober, I took it and you know, just because I, person is not here physically uh, on earth, that doesn't mean we don't have a continuing relationship with them. And so as I got into uh, uh, recovery, you know, I felt like I was encouraged and supported by my dad every step of the way. And for coming on 39 years now, I stayed clean and sober one day at a time, always feeling like I had the encouragement and the support of my dad, uh, every everything they ever asked of me, uh, any therapy, any, uh, any 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 group, any book, any any exercise that was ever suggested to me, I always said yes, and I always felt like I had to take extreme measures to protect my mental and emotional and spiritual health 
because I know what, what is, is possible for me. Uh, so first thing is just being clean and sober and being able to pass that along and help others has been, has been a real blessing. Now, the other thing is being a teenage son of a, of a dad who completed suicide, turns out there's a lot of teenage sons of parents who have ended their lives. And so uh, when I was introduced to the uh, Survivor Support Group at the Baton Rouge Crisis Center, I took a hold of that as a lifeline, okay, and uh, got involved in that group uh, for quite a, a good number of years. and and then into a local outreach for survivors of suicide, the lost team for quite a number of years was given an opportunity to meet with un, you know, quite a number of families, quite a number of young people who had been right where I was. So being in recovery and being recovering from my, uh, the, the, the trauma and the pain of my dad's death, I was able to share a story of healing and hope, uh, helping others and in the process helping myself. That was the unexpected silver lining, the blessing of being able to help others with recovery and with being a family survivor of suicide is that I would be the primary beneficiary. I didn't realize that, but that's been the, that's been the case. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And it sort of goes back to something that was the most hurtful to you. You turned it around and you became the most helpful for other people that are now struggling with the same loss. So thank you. Frank, how would you find, how have you found purpose for your pain? Um, yeah, so for me, I think Tessa was saying that it's just finding your purpose and finding your passions and your purpose. And so, um, you know, I've done that through public speaking. Obviously, I found a passion for mental health. Um, and then obviously I was talking about creating a mental health awareness organization at my school um, called Be Nice, where we, we try to really educate and teach kids about what mental health actually is and have op open conversations through those, through that education. Um, with that is the way we're defeating the stigma of mental health um, in school communities. And so, as well as, um, you know, my passion might be different from somebody else's passion. You know, I like to do driving range, go to the driving range and record stores and stuff like that. But for some, for another kid, it might be completely different. So I would just encourage everybody to kind of find their passion and what they, what they like to do. And that'll really help you, I promise. So I'm just really proud and, you know, I, and I know the youngest one on the panel because the rest of us are kind of old, but I look at you, Frank, as such an inspiration and a role model for other peers and looking at Mark's story and how it can really destroy your future and destroy your life. And it's just been a year. And I think what a beautiful honor to do for your, son, for your friend, but also to help other peers so that your school doesn't have to have this happen again. But also the fact that it, it you know, you're, you're almost into that post-traumatic growth already to where you have really found yourself and found a purpose that's not only going to help you, but to help other people. So thank you much, so much for your courage. So our next question is going to be, um, where do you feel you're right now in your journey? Like, where are you now? And, you know, as we know, like this journey, you know, as we go, it's like our journey continues to go up and down and there's twists and there's Christmas and then there's holidays and then there's another death. So there's many things that can send us back, but we're always coming forward again. So I, I'm gonna ask Tisa, Matisse, so where do you feel you are like right now? Um, in order for me to speak on where I am right now, I must tell you where I actually came from spiritually. Um, I'm actually a very highly spiritual person and um, I must admit I was angry with God. I never said that to anyone other than my group. But I tell you, I was angry. And the response that I got back was, God already knew I was mad. He knew my heart. I just needed to speak it into existence to him and he would move me forward. And that's exactly what I did. I spoke that I was angry he moved me forward and I was able to go ahead. So for where I feel right now, I continue to learn about, more about mental health, even after Brittany's death. Some things I wish I have known before she passed that may have helped get me through, but I, I recommend anyone, I recommend that ed educating yourself to be a strong advocate for quality care for yourself or loved ones is the best way. 
Thank you, Matisse. She, she knows she has part of my, my heart and she's just so lovely. So thank you, Matisse. And I'm, I'm so glad that you found your faith again or where well, you didn't lose it, but I, that you found that space where it's going to help you and not hurt you. So Tessa. I am in a place now I could not have dreamt of seven years ago. And that is because I have finally been able to accept that I will never understand why Jeff left me. I, it was his decision. And accepting that has enabled me to accept love, accept happiness, accept joy. For the first few years, um, what happened that day was always in front of my face. Um, it took a lot of therapy and a lot of help to be able to see past it. My grief coach once asked me to describe Jeff and I said he was a loving husband, a wonderful father, a good man, but he died by suicide. And my coach said, what if you take the word but and replace it with and? And so now I say he was a wonderful husband he was a loving father, he was a good man, and he died by suicide. And that has made all the difference. And I'm able to remember him and cherish our memories without the overwhelming pain. Thank you, Tessa. It's just a hard journey, isn't it? Just a hard journey for each one of you. Mark, what might you say about the, your journey and where you're at now? Well, I have to say that I'm amazed at the distance traveled in the span of my lifetime concerning my dad's uh, illness and his death and its impact on me. I've come from being shattered, tortured, frozen uh, to, I would consider myself more or less completely thawed out, um, uh, happy, uh, very little residual pain and anguish. In fact, I would say none. I see my, I was, I felt that most of my life, like I was sentenced to, to live, like I had no choice but because my dad ended his life, I had to live. It was the end of my life, it was not a choice. That's how I actually live. And I've gone to the point now where I treasure every moment of my life. Uh, and I absolutely am so grateful and thankful for my life and the people in it. The, uh, I think that I'm typical in that left alone, this just, it's just unimaginable how, how badly we can torture ourselves. But in the presence of uh, loving, safe uh, support groups, fellowships, uh, people, survivors of the same shipwreck, there's just no, there's just no describing how, how far we can heal and, and how much peace we can find with that which we just the other year we couldn't even live with. Uh, mostly what I would characterize my life about today is grateful and appreciative towards the people who've helped me and the, and the people who've been in my life and whatever role they've had, including my dad. I don't have a residual uh, issues with saying suicide or any of those kinds of things. I'm not afraid of that pain. I'm not afraid of others' pain. And I'm just very, very happy and grateful and appreciative of the journey I've been on people have helped me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Frank, where are you at on your journey? Um, you know, I think, you know, obviously I'm not 100% at peace with everything, um, but one thing I, I have done is found a lot of clarity in everything in my life personally. Um, I feel like I found purpose and clarity in everything that I do. Um, even with me doing this panel right now, it's just my, the purpose of this is just to help somebody else. So I think um, knowing that I can be a factor and a voice for other kids um, sh by sharing my story, I think is a big, a big piece of uh, what I do every day. And I think that's a big part of my purpose. So just finding my purpose was um, where I'm at in my journey and I found a lot of clarity um, after th the passing of my friend. Okay, so thank you. That it's just, it just shows we're on our journey that we're all in different spaces at different times. And you know, sometimes we loop back around um, so thank, thank you to each and every one of you for the courage to share um, your stories with us with the hopes of helping others. So now is the time that we had talked about where each of our viewers um, who had questions or comments in the, in the chat box or on Facebook, 
Uh, we're going to talk about those for the next 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to respond to as many as we can. And if there are any that we can't reach, we'll be, be sure to contact yourself. So the first question or comment is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Then after the Q&A portion, I apologize. After the um, first 10, 15 minutes, um, we would then be uh, virtually joining in the Memorial Forest, followed by closing statements from each of our panelists. So 10 to 15 minutes here. Then we are going to go into the Memorial Forest, and then we'll come back for closing. So the first question is, um, how do I cope with understanding a death when I tried to get help, but it wasn't successful? So I think that's probably the question we get asked the most is, um, and maybe I think Matisse, if you're okay answering that question, I th think it might be helpful because I know that you try to help Brittany and in the end you still had lost her. So I would say that um, trying till you found something that was right for you or someone who was invested in you. Um, if there's no investment on, on the provider's half, then you'll get nowhere because you're like speaking to dead, dead space. So it does take time. I did mention in my first uh, answer, Brene had three not so wonderful years. Um, it does take time and it's not an overnight process. You have to be able to um, find someone that you click with and that understands what you're going through as well and is able to help. That, like for Matisse, it's really hard when you try to help someone and then they still take their life. Um, it feels like you failed, but did the system fail? And it's really try, trying to understand. And I will tell you, in all honesty, we can do everything right. The system, the healthcare can do everything right. And this individual still felt hopeless because their pain was more intense than the skills that they had or their coping skills. And you know, sometimes I have to say I had to forgive myself for what I didn't know or what I didn't do, but I have to come to this understanding of no matter what I would have done, if I would have saved them this time or another time, I can't possibly know what the next time would be or the outcome. And it's really just working yourself through that um, to understand that if it was our choice, they would be here today. But in the end, we didn't have that much control over their life or death. All we could do is reach out, get them connected, but in the end, it's where they were at in their pain. So the next question was, how do you talk to someone who once attempted suicide about how they're feeling? Um, for my response to that is, I call it a check-in. So after someone has attempted, I might check in every few days, and I'm gonna let them know, I'm not gonna do this from now to the rest of your life, but I just wanna check in and where you're at with your thoughts today, what is something that I did that was helpful or that someone else did that was helpful for you. I wanna make sure I continue to do that. I try not to go back and say, so I've had thought about suicide today, but I might say something like, I'm just checking in with you today to see where you're at, because if we don't go back and check in, it sort of becomes that shameful feeling. Um, ask them how often it, that you can check in with them. Give them a little control over those questions. Um, they don't want you to be afraid. They don't want to fear you. They don't want to disappoint or hurt us. So giving them some thoughts or um, control and asking them, what can I do to help keep you safe? And is it okay if I check in with you? Thank you for that question. The next question was, are there resources for those who live in constant fear of a future suicide? Um, I, I would say the answer to that is support groups are really helpful. Um, I do understand, and I know in our support group, and I don't know if uh, Mark might want to respond to this question about once we lose one person to suicide, it makes us doubt, and it also makes us vulnerable that there could be another one. So again, I think it's about processing it, talking about and talking it through, especially as a family. But Mark, do you have any thoughts on this question? of if there's resources for those who live in constant fear? Absolutely, it's that being able to, uh, you know, vocalize, speak that fear, the biggest thing that somebody can do to kind of alleviate it and, uh, and, re and you know, be reassured that we just don't have as much power as we wish we had, but being, trying to find some kind of group, some kind of support group that of, of, of safe people who, uh, who, can, who can, you can vocalize those feelings, too. It's got to be the biggest thing. 
and that that will help you get some perspective about you know what you can and what you can't do. Thank you. So I'd like to ask, ask the panelists um, again. How does it feel to be sort of in this public view and that expectations because when you lose someone to suicide, does it feel like people judge you? Does it feel like, what do people think about me? So I'm wondering what your thoughts, maybe Matissa, if you can respond to this question of what was it like for you today to know that you have people listening to you and looking for hope? For, for me today, um knowing that I have people watching, I feel supported. Um, I never really felt that I was looked at negative to, negatively um, because of the feedback that I normally would get. Um, if you knew Brene, you knew I was right behind her. So um, I enjoy, I, I think the support has been great um, for me. Thank you, Matissa. So I think one more question, I guess even a comment to all the viewers is that we really appreciate the fact that you're here to listen, to support, but also to make sure if you have any more questions or comments. But at this time, what we wanna do is we wanna end this portion to make sure that we have time for our, the rest of what was on our agenda today. But now is the time that we're going to move to the Memorial Forest that was created by Gail Urso, the co-founder of the Kevin Song each of the doves that you'll see displayed, um, that you'll see on the trees, will display the name of someone we lost to suicide. Afterwards, we're gonna come back for closing statements from each of our panelists, as well as myself. In a moment, what I want you to do is, I, as we spend a few minutes in the memorial forest, reflect not only on the pain of grief, but from the lives lost, but the beauty that they left us and the lives that they lived. So we're just gonna listen for a few moments and then we'll be back with some closing statements. And what you're going to see on the screen are the names of people who have died by suicide. So this is our moment to remember not only their death, but in the joy that they brought us in their lives. So let's take a moment, please.
Thank you, Gail and friends, for that beautiful memorial forest. It's it's one of those things that we look forward to every year when we're in person to just kind of to sit and be with ourselves and with others of similar loss and also to be present in the life of the person that we lost. So thank you for that beautiful memorial forest. So welcome back. And, and before we sort of wrap up the end of this portion of the um, this hour to talk with you in the panel. I'd like to ask each of our panelists for one last message or one last thing they'd like to say with each one of our voices, our viewers. So at this point, um, we'd like to ask Frank, um, what would you like to say for anyone listening to t today? Um, yeah, um, before I give my impact statement, I just want to give a thank you to um, you, Ms. Smith, and the, the co-panelists that are up here with me today. Um, just extending my hand of gratitude to you guys and for, this, it takes a lot of courage to share your story about mental health especially on a public platform like this. So I just want to uh, give a thank you out to everybody who put this together today. Um, but my impact statement would be to um, any, uh, any schools or counselors or teachers or parents out there um, who are having a hard time understanding their child and, or what they may be going through. Um, I just want to say it's a, it's a ton of resources out there um, for your kid to get help um, and for someone to, to talk to. So, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta reach out and look for those resources. Um, I also want to emphasize how important um, talking about this in school is because I know um, for our, our school in particular, a lot of kids didn't feel like they had the outlet to um, talk to maybe a teacher or a parent or a counselor. Maybe they didn't feel comfortable or maybe they felt like they were going to be judged for how they felt. So if you initiate a program into your school that's feasible um, and gives students the option to really come and express how they feel every day without feeling like they'll be labeled, labeled or judged for how they feel, then I think you'll have a positive impact. In, um, the state of your school will be a lot more um, positive as well. So yeah, that's my impact statement. Thank you. And thank you so much for the courage that it took for you to be a voice for your peers and hopefully other adults and educators and parents hear the message that you shared with us today. Mark, what might you have to say to our viewers today? Whatever goodness is in me, whatever virtues and gifts that uh, that have arisen in me never could have existed had I not first suffered. Uh, I'm full of gratitude today for the suffering that broke me in two and made me what I call a broken, open-hearted person. The most beautiful people I know are those who have been broken open and have become broken, open-hearted, tenderized people, uh, compassionate and kind to others. Uh, and that's what I aspire to be, is uh, broken open hearted by the things that broke me in two. The, I'm not afraid today of suffering and sorrow, and there's a lot of suffering and sorrow out there. I'm not afraid of it, mine or yours. I know it carries a silver lining. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy and grateful to be able to help alleviate suffering. and. Uh, be, be a part of support groups and, and help for others whenever I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your sharing your journey with us and bringing hope to others. And I, I think when I talked to you before, you just said it so beautifully that you now have this joy and you have peace. And those are words that are just so um, powerful and we can't often find them or feel them in the first years of our grief. So yeah, I know that you brought hope to many people just to know that no matter where you're at right now, it doesn't always have to be. There's never too late to ask for help. So thank you for that message today. Tessa? Seven years ago, I thought my life was over. Um, there were many of my friends who thought that I wish I could have crawled in Jeff's casket. In my darkest days, though, I still had hope. And it was a hope that eluded Jeff. It's the hope that I would give all of you who are struggling. You don't have to do it alone. And you can't do it alone. You have to reach out. I've been told over and over how strong I am, but the only strength I have is that I do not give up. And I know that as long as I'm trying, there is a chance that it will get better. So don't give up. Don't let yourself be defined by what your loved one did. You can have a future. You can have a life. 
Tessa, sure have come a long way. And even just since the last time we talked, you're just full of inspiration. So thank you for that. Matisa, what might you want to say? My plea for each and every one is to advocate, advocate for quality mental health, care for all people. So, so no mother would need to sit on a panel discussing their child's story of suicide. Thank you all for listening to me telling my story of my beautiful and so well-loved Brittany and helping me find my purpose for my pain. Thank you. I wanna say thank to each of you for spending time with us on our personal journey here today and to also thank Kevin Song and the Detroit Public Television for the opportunity to share our stories and bringing us together. It is my hope that you two share your story to empower people and to help find purpose for your pain. I also want to note that each one of these panelists, it took so much courage and to really know that they did this not only for themselves and for the people they lost, but they brought this to each one of you. So to remember that for the resources, you can call your local t your 211 to find a local support group in your community. You can visit online at suicidology.org. You can also email Gigi at i4hope.com. You can access myself and my network if you need any guidance at 989-781-5260 or at srrn.net. We also have um, Nancy Buell, who is one of the advisors for Kevin Song, and she has also made herself available. So if you need to talk to anyone now in regards to you know, um, surviving, please note that we would be happy to answer in the questions at the end of this conference. Also, if you're in crisis, let's do what maybe our loved ones couldn't do or didn't do. Please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text hello to 741-741 to reach the local crisis text line. And as always, you can find more resources on kevinsong.org. And remember, you can check back in a week or two and you will be able to watch this again and hopefully share it with someone that you know could benefit as well. Thank you and my wish for you is hope, strength and peace. Thank you.